Good, good afternoon. Good. I am not the act. The act's <laughs> coming in a moment. But I thought I'd just um, gazump him for, for one second and get your attention while you're all sitting here agog and waiting. Um, I wanted to, first of all, welcome everybody to the Charleston Festival. Um, it's wonderful to be kicking off again. And I hope you've all got your thermal underwear and all the rest of it and your picnics. Um, I want to let you know that we have two sort of firework displays to begin with. Um, some very, very good news for the Charleston Trust. The first thing some of you may have already seen on the internet um, that we have today announced our first royal patron. Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall has agreed to be the patron for Charleston. And we could not be more delighted. She visited Charleston a couple of years ago on an official visit, fell in love with the place. She has many local connections. And we're delighted to think that she'll be supporting the centenary project through its ensuing phases. The second announcement. <laughs> The second announcement, which I'm delighted to have the opportunity to make in front of you all, is that um, just last week, the trustees of Charleston confirmed the appointment of Alistair Burtonshaw as the new director of Charleston. And um, he uh, has been here since January, holding the fort. He's done an absolutely marvelous job. I know that we're not going to be able to ever manage without him. We say that about all our directors. And we're just thrilled that he's going to be also seeing the centenary project through um, everything that's going to happen in the next four to five years. And um, he is going to be coming on the platform in a moment to introduce our speaker. So familiarize yourself with his friendly face. And um, if anybody wants to talk to him during the festival, of course, do, do go up and uh, make yourself known and, uh, and become, become familiar with... Uh, with our new director. So that's all I wanted to say to you all. Um, and Alistair's now going to come on and introduce the real act. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm not sure I'm the real act. This is the real act. Um, ladies and gentlemen, honoured guests, welcome to the opening event of the 24th annual Charleston Literary Festival. As you've just heard, my name is Alistair Burtonshaw, and as the new director at Charleston, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this very, very special festival. But just before we start, if, you, if I may, a quick housekeeping announcement. Please, can you just take a moment to note the location of the fire exits, as they say, and the marquee in the very unlikely event that we need to evacuate? Please follow the instructions of Charleston staff who will direct you to a safe assembly point. I will also be very grateful if you could take a moment now to check that your mobile phones are off. Well, <laughs> yours is off, I know, I saw it. <laughs> so... I can think of no better discussion to open the festival than that which we have planned for the, uh, this afternoon between actor, novelist, film director, conservative life peer, Oscar-winning screenwriter and all-round good egg Julian Fellows <laughs> and social historian and author Juliet Nicholson. Born in Cairo, Julian grew up in Kensington and read English literature at Cambridge where he was a member of Footlights. Lord of the Manor, I believe, of Tattershall in Lincolnshire, he has been long fascinated by the British class system, a constant theme across his work. Julian has been a most welcome presence on our screens. Who can forget his role as Kilwilly in Monarch of the Glen and in, li <laughs> here. And in the life of our nation? Indeed, not even the killing off of Matthew Crawley in Series 3 of Downton Abbey seems to have dented his inexorable and thoroughly deserved rise to national treasure status. He has also been a driving force behind our screens as a leading screenwriter and director since the success of Gosford Park, which you will all know, which, for which he won the Best Screenwriting Oscar in 2002. 
Screenwriting credits over the last decade include Vanity Fair, Young Victoria and Titanic, and all have sealed his stellar reputation. A regular pre presenter of programmes such as this year's wonderful Great Houses, he is of course best known as the creator and writer of the phenomenon that is Downton Abbey, winner of this year's National Television Best Drama Award and countless Emmys and international prizes. Juliet Nicholson was educated at Benenden until being removed by her father to be tutored at home, I believe. Is that correct? <laughs> we, won't, we won't comment on that. <laughs> I said you might have to forgive me for my introduction. <laughs> the granddaughter of Vita Sackville West is Harold Nicholson. She went to Baylor College, Oxford, to study English, which was followed by a career in publishing at Hamish Hamilton and Jonathan Cape. She is the author of The Perfect Summer, Dancing into the Shadow in 1911, The Great Silence, 1918 to 1920, Living in the Shadow of the Great War, and most recently, of course, Abdication. Juliet has also written for numerous uh, newspapers and magazines, and as I'm sure you will agree, is the perfect interviewer for our delve behind the scenes. But before we go behind the scenes to explore what it means to be a late developer of the British class system, and maybe even some of Julian's most recent work, I'd like to give a very special thanks to our sponsors, Goranges of Lewis, who are here today um, for their support of this, our opening festival event. So ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, please give a warm welcome to Julian Fellows and Juliet Nichols. everyone and how how thrilling to be here on on uh, day one de event one event one day one we're the inaugural oh, event it's a bit aggressive there is it is it working can can everybody hear me talk up a bit go a bit nearer yeah is that better julian do you want to have a go one two three four <laughs> yeah is that all right we want to hear more about why she was thrown out of school then. <laughs> I think it's much more interesting than whether or not Matthew Crawley had to die. <laughs> much more interesting is that I went to Balliol College where they didn't take girls actually until 1990. So, I, you know, I didn't really have that great a time. Yeah, to... I'm just, can I, while you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, are, you, are you leaving? I'm going to move this back because it's in the way of some right. people over there. Very good. Audience aware. Okay. A director through and through. That's it. There we are. Well, now the thing is, um, this 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 downtown thing. <laughs> um, we are going to have a clip actually um, quite soon, in a minute or two. Um, and I, I probably ought to say to everybody that um, it's so, I sort of feel like that announcer when she's about to give the score results on match of the day. So I, if anybody hasn't watched the last scene <laughs> on series three... You're in trouble. <laughs> you better leave the tent now if you're still saving it up for a, for a rainy day. Um, the thing is, if we just do a few stats, perhaps, or a few bit of the Downton phenomenon stuff before we get to the sort of nitty-gritty a bit later, um, uh, you are responsible for giving many people 11 million or so the gloomiest Christmas they ever had. <laughs> um, well, it's quite late on. They'd had, they'd, they'd had their Christmas by then. You know, sales of port and so on, you know, they rocketed. What could we do to cheer ourselves up? Um, 220 territories. Is, I don't, I'm not quite sure what territories are. I, it's seen I, 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 in 220 territories. I agree with you, because I don't think there are 220 countries, are there? I, I don't know how many countries there are. Someone else immediately say, yes, there are 273. But um, I don't really know what a territory is. I know we play to 120 million people, which seems to me rather extraordinary. Uh, but anyway, we do. And that is over 220 territories. Right, 220 territories. Now, um, it's got to such a level that you have now, I gather, are about to succumb to the merchandise. 
Yes, now, what's I, that? Is that loo paper? Is that well, tiaras? What is that? What is that? I, do you know, I'd love to be able to give you an informed reply, but I learned about it on the internet. Oh, yeah. So like I me. know very, very little <laughs> about it. I mean, I, there are already books and things. I don't really know what else you would do. I suppose sort of school lunch boxes featuring Lady Mary. I don't, I don't know what merchandising is in this context, because the real merchandising is to be found in the antique shop down in the village. That's the real merchandising of downside that we... Downside. Downton. The Brookside. voice of Catholicism never leaves you. But... Um, I mean, one of the rather nice things is we have boosted very much the sales of what you, has just been rechristened brown furniture rather unattractively. Uh, and brown furniture has gone up like bilio, and so has uh, silver, you know, and plate and all that sort of thing. Uh, and, they come, and they come in and they say, oh, we want some Downton stuff. Mm. I love that. I think that's so great. Mm. So in a way, I can't see how our merchandising can top that. Mm. But I certainly hope it does. <laughs> um, it seems to me, though, before we, before we see this clip, that this, this phenomenon that it, that it has become, um, Stephen Fry has said, uh, that, that there is something about your writing that is, a, that is he says, it's a guilty treat. <laughs> and I wonder if it's slightly in the tradition of the whole sort of Lady Chatterley, oh, I only bought it for my butler. The Daily Mail, oh, I only picked up the copy that was left on the seat beside me in the train. I don't really uh, read it myself. And uh, Hello Magazine, you know, it's only in The Dentist that I see it. Well, and is there a sort of down to me kind of like, I don't really watch it, I just somehow find myself with nothing else to do on Sunday nights? I mean, a, a bit less in Downton when it sort of became um, a topic. You know, this thing, the water cooler moment, which we've got from America, where you make programs that people talk about the following day when they go into the office. And I think we did achieve that a bit, but you're quite right. Normally, anything that I've either written or appeared in, people only say, oh, well, you know, I was cooking and the dog jumped up and turned on the television. And, and by heavens, there you were. And, and um, nobody will ever say, oh, I was so looking forward to your program and I turned it on. Uh, and, oh, yes, my grandmother always watches it. But... Um, I, I think we, down to, we did get slightly beyond that because of all the sort of t t Twittering and, and Facebook and all that mm. kind of thing. Uh, we got into the conversation. I always remember there was a moment in the first series, not very far in actually, and I opened the Times and on page three there was this huge picture of the three girls, the three sisters. And, and, and I thought, what, why? What's happened? And then the headline said... George Osborne belongs in the cast of Downton Abbey. And it was all a, an attack on the Chancellor for some policy he was bringing in. And that was the moment I thought, oh, we're getting into the zeitgeist now. We've got, we've, you know those things, it's rather like with sports people, when you don't know anything about boxing, but you know who Muhammad Ali is. You don't know anything about football, but you know who David Beckham is. And I think that we nudged into that, where we became a television programme that even people who never watched, at least they were aware of. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, people describe things as... Um, Downton-esque. I mean, you're, yeah, we you're became an adjective. You, you became right. an adjective. You're, you know, you're along there with Pinter. You know, God help me. <laughs> you know, isn't it? In oh, a way, I hesitate to make that. <laughs> but it's an, it's when you become the adjective that you've arrived, isn't it? You know, mm. I mean, it's pretty. All I mean, these things make me nervous. Perhaps we should just have a look, if we could, at. Um, the, I believe that we're going to see the cricket scene. Oh, the cricket. Um, at the end of um, series three, three when um, storm clouds brackets war is... Uh, is no, no. no, no, no. No, darling, the war's all no, over. No, what, so what, what's you happening can, at the cricket scene? You can see how much she watches No, no, no. <laughs> I'm addicted, of course. No, it's um, it's to do with is is the mar. No, you tell me what it is, because I I I am. See, <laughs> it's rather disheartening in a way. <laughs> but no, we've got to we've got to the end. Everything lovely. Matthew married to Mary. Yes. All the little plots of people buying hats and dropping saucepans all resolved for the year, and then they were playing cricket, and Branson had resisted joining. 
the tribe. Oh, yes. And of then course. he was persuaded to That's by right. good Matthew. Yes, yes. Lots of bonhomie. Everyone's nice in Downton, really, even if some of them are only nice in a way. But um, it's a program of nice people. Well, let's have a look at those nice people, if we could. Now we're in a state of suspended. I have to do for myself. Ready? As ready as I'll ever be. Remember why she was in such a state? Now you oh my God! Now we're trying. We're about to find out whether or not Mrs. Hughes has a serious illness. Yes. We were briefed wrongly. Sure of one thing. I won't be cured by standing here. Sure, that's the clip I'd have chosen. <laughs> um, it's not a very bouncy moment, <laughs> except it gives you a little glimmer of Carson's unadmitted and suppressed affection for Mrs. Hughes. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, I want to be to get explored on to that. at a later date. Definitely, definitely. Oh well. Anyway, that's the one we got. <laughs> um, what I what I really I think just want to I want to ask you um, just sort of one very specific question about why Downton has been so is being so successful, um, and then after that I'd like to sort of go back to sort of where you began and to sort of move forward again um, and then go in for the nitty gritty about. Does Shirley MacLaine get on <laughs> with? I'm entirely in your hands. <laughs> so, so Julian, what, it, what, it, what is this? What to what do you ascribe this fantastic, extraordinary, 220 territory global hit? Um. Of course, the, the real truth is, if I knew the answer to that, I'd never do anything but write enormous hits that played in 220 territories. I don't, I don't really know. You know, you make a show, you do your best, uh, you know, and you write, and sometimes things you think will go through the roof, nothing happens at all, and other times you do something for VAT, and, and you know, it's a big success. But this one... I, Having pers been persuaded, the original idea came from Gareth Nima, who wanted me quite consciously to go back into the territory of Gosford Park, this film we were talking about a bit earlier, which is about a shooting party. I don't know if you've seen it. And, um, and it had done very well, and we realized we had to go back 20 years because the whole subtext of Gosford Park is that it's all coming to an end. Mm. So if, if it was going to have any legs, we had to go back. But I, you know, I was very hesitant, and it seems funny now, but I, I was rather nervous. I mean, I could sort of hear the critics, you know, saying so much better in the film. And, um, and I thought that's what I'd get. But anyway, in the end, I was persuaded to do it. And I, I, I thought it was good. I thought we were incredibly lucky with the cast we got. We really did get first choice on pretty well... Everyone. I mean, actually, you always say that when you've released a show, but it's not usually true. And, uh, you know, you always say, oh, yes, absolutely first, first choice. But, uh, in fact, we really did get first choice. And, and, and that was luck. 
it's not just, that's not me being modest. It's not just because whether or not they want to do it with the script, but sometimes people are making a film in the Netherlands or they're filming in South Africa or something, they can't do it. And we didn't have any of that. You know, we managed to hit a moment when absolutely nothing was happening. And, uh, and we profited from it. So we did have a fantastic cast. But when you, we saw it, uh, I thought it was good. I was very pleased with it. I thought it had worked and everything. But it seemed quite arcane beyond the shores. And, and I thought it would find its own audience within... Britain, of course, originally Scotland wasn't allowed to watch it because Scottish television decided there was no audience for it. So we were only playing to England. And um, mm. they took it back a bit red-facedly. But, um, uh, you know, at that stage, I thought it would play well in England. But I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I think there are one or two things we got right, although, as with everything else in life, more through luck than judgment. But... We, from the very beginning, we did make a decision not to prejudge the situation in the sense that if it had been made in the 50s, uh, all the family would have been gracious and charming and the servants would all have been funny. If it had been made in the 90s, uh, all the servants would have been gallant and struggling and hard done by and all the family would have been vile and mendacious. And, and we decided not to do either of those. We just had a group of people mm. who were living and working for different reasons under one roof. And so we don't have any difference at all in the fate of Cora or the fate of Mrs. Hughes mm. or the fate of Carson or the fate of Robert. We just, they're just all having their lives. And I... I have a feeling, you know, supported by the show's popularity, that that was writer for the, for the zeitgeist now, for the moment now, that we weren't telling the audience who they were supposed to be taking more seriously, and the audience could pick their own favourites, essentially. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know. Yes, and I mean, I think the clip that we saw by mistake just now... <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous, sh of course. Shows, ...does show, in a way, that, about how we care as much about um, Mrs. Hughes and her illness and um, the love affair between Anna and Bates um, as, as we do about Mary and Matthew. It, there's, a, there's a sort of equality of emotional commitment given to up and down, if, if you like. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that, that we, could, we could see that. But there is this other thing, which I think is, I think, myself, is this... Um, Possibly, um, one doesn't always admit this uh, hankering for an olden day, a good olden day, nostalgia. I mean, in the sort of tradition of, 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 of Brideshead, of um, Remains of the Day, of Upstairs, Downstairs itself, of, of Gosford. Um, and you have said, I'm always, I'm always giving you quotes, and, then, and you, you, you don't, you don't never heard of you. So I, ne I never said that, but here's yeah. one. Anyway, I'm going to try you on this business of, um, um, you've, you wrote, one sign of growing old is that the past becomes more real than the present, and already I can feel the fingers of those lost decades closing their grip round my imagination, making more recent memory seem somehow greyer and less bright. And that's, I mean, that was actually in, in, in a novel, that's a, a, a fictional character, but I feel it to be your your words and that it's so therefore it's not your only your own past but sort of other people's past that somehow or other it was better then it was sunnier it was I don't I yes I um I think there's a distinction between personal nostalgia and a shared nostalgia um I think that in one's own life the mere fact that when you were young the experiences you had were very vivid and exciting. You thought that anything was possible. You're, you were going to have this extraordinary life when you were in love with someone. You were never going to be in love again. And, you know, all of that. And it makes your youth very vivid. I mean, at times difficult to support and rather depressing, but nevertheless very vivid. As you get older and the wheel goes round and round and you see people in miniskirts for the eighth time or, or whatever it is and 
fashions come and go, and, you know, butter's bad for you, butter's good for you, butter gives you cancer, butter makes you get married. It, it, I mean, all of these things you live through. Yeah. Have a glass of wine a day, it'll stop your heart attack. If you have a glass of wine a day, you'll, you know, you'll die of leprosy. And, uh, uh, and you stop, you stop taking it so seriously. It's like politics, you know, when you're young. Politics seems incredibly important that you must get around. But as you go on, parties come in of different persuasions and, you know, this is a bit better under this lot and that's a bit better under that lot. But a, a great sameness seems to descend on you. And I think that that's the personal journey through life. I think there's something different that you're talking about is that when there is a period of insecurity, when a society loses faith in itself. I mean, there are certain societies that are tremendously confident. The, you could say that the, the late Victorians from uh, the sort of 1870s to the end of the century felt rather marvelous about themselves. Of course, there were people critical of, the, of their values, writing and living and painting and everything else. But nevertheless, the sort of consensus was the man who is born an Englishman has drawn a winning ticket in the lottery of life. And uh, if you can remember, America in the 50s had this extraordinary confidence about itself. Mm -hmm. The America of Sandra Dee and Troy Donahue when everyone would rather be American, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember that with some nostalgia myself. I, I loved America's belief in itself. I didn't feel it was, you know, uh, completely balanced in the sense that I don't think people, everyone in the world wanted to be American even then. But nevertheless, there was something very attractive about a society believing in itself. And we're not in one of those periods now. We're in a period where we have inherited the sort of social and moral um, undermining of the 60s and 70s when we, we threw out uh, all the rules, thinking to liberate ourselves and make ourselves enjoy a much freer society, which in some ways, of course, we did. But in others, there is a slight sense at the moment we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And because of that, uh, I think you do get a kind of um, enjoyment of a period in which things seem more secure. Mm. I say seem because I doubt that any period is, is you know, completely secure when, it's, when you're actually living it. But, I mean, I think it's, it's true that before the war, I don't think so much the 20s where we've gone into now in the series. I think the 20s is an interesting period because it was very febrile because one, they didn't quite know where it was going. Had the old world survived the first war, or hadn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think, so in a way you're talking about sort of escapism. I mean, it, yeah, to, kind to of go escapism. a sort of escapism, when you're in the doldrums, a, a, a sort of an, a, there's a national sense of a doldrum, a down. You, you look to the past for escape. I mean, I think in the 20s, immediately after the First World War, there was instant nostalgia for the days the good old days before the First World War, when the sun always shone. Sure. Actually, it rained every single year between 1900 and 1914, except for one, 1911, when it was boiling hot. But actually, the reality was it rained, but everybody was already talking about the golden summers before the First World War in the 1920s. Sure. And so, the, you know, the mind plays the tricks, of course, particularly when you're when you're low. But also remember but, that television drama gives you history light so that uh, you, you know, you watch the sort of form and, and in that phrase, you know, um, everyone knowing how it works and who they are. And so but you don't have to get up at four in the morning, go and clean out the kitchen stove, you know. You don't have to go and lay the fires mm. and polish in the drawing room so mm. it's all done before they come down for breakfast. Mm. So, in fact, you're enjoying it without paying for it. Mm. And um, I think in itself, you know, history light is, is enjoyable because mm. you take out all the bad dentistry and uh, everything else mm. that we're rather glad to avoid. And the smell. Smell. Yes, that's rather unattractive. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Although, when I think back, even to my childhood, 
there. I mean, it, we must all have smelled dreadful, dreadful because no no deodorants were yeah. considered. I remember completely sort of sissy and ghastly, and that was when they arrived. Never mind before they arrived. Mm. And you think of those thick dinner jackets and things, people. Honestly, it must have smelled like a stable. But I suppose we just sort of didn't hoist it in. Sorry. Well. <laughs> I, I don't remember <laughs> running out of the dining room and going, poo. Oh, but, I see. But, it, I mean, it must have been <laughs> yeah. quite pongy, mustn't it? Oh, I think so. I think horrible. But um, let's not talk about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'd like to talk about you, actually. I'd like okay. to talk about you as opposed to um, the, the phenomenon. This is what I'm calling it, capital TP. Um your your story, it seems to me, in sort of encapsulation, is one of of hope for all of the rest of us in two <laughs> ways, in two marvelous ways: professional and personal, love and work. Okay, so let's just talk a bit about your family and where you came from, because you're a Sussex man, sort of, aren't you? I was, I'm not a member of a Sussex family, but my parents bought a house down in Chiddingly in East Sussex in um, 1959 and um, because I was the fourth of four boys and I had just gone off to boarding school to, to Gilling in Yorkshire and so once we were all at boarding school my parents thought it was more realistic to have their sort of main house in the country and, um, and that was why that was the date. And, uh, and they looked for a house and they bought it in Chillingly. So from then on, I grew up in East Sussex, yeah. And did you, do, do you have a lifelong love for here? No, I was very, we were very mm. happy in East Sussex. We were sort of, we were London children before that. And suddenly, you know, we had ponies mm. and all that sort of thing mm. you do. And um, it was a nice life, but it was... Um, a much more modest world then. In, in, I mean, I know that sound, it sound. Part of it was much duller, but it it, it was more modest. There were the, the enormous amounts of money people make and, and things like. It wasn't like that in the fifties. You know, in the your your mother sort of made her own clothes and and all of that stuff. So it that's just that's gone. You know, I, I I find all that quite interesting, really. Mm. So it wasn't a smart. You, you didn't grow up in a sort of smart house. No, with lots no, of servants no. And I like mean, I, we bought a sort of wreckage, you know, and um, and it was, you know, it was nice. I mean, it was nice, and we had fires and panelling and Christmas trees in the hall, you know. But it, but it wasn't. I mean, the trouble is with the media. There are only two backgrounds that are ascribed to you the moment you're in the news. One is you're living in a palace with about 58 servants, and the other is you grew up lying under a sheet of corrugated iron somewhere on the M1. And, and they don't really have anything in between the two. But, uh, you know, we just had one of those lives, and, and, and it was perfectly ordin well, ordinary. ordinary to, I mean, I think when you're a child, you don't compare your life to anything much beyond your own ken. You know, you think, oh, they've got a better bicycle or their father's got a much better car, which in my case was always true, and, and um, you know, that sort of thing. But I don't, I don't think as a child you say, you know, a third of the world is, is in this situation. You just don't. I think that's one of the great growth periods of university mm. is that you suddenly at university begin to put yourself into a kind of universe and to, and to examine your own prejudices and beliefs in accordance to what you are learning about how you were brought up and, and where that stands in relation to everyone else. But, I, you know, I don't think you think like that at 11. You just think, when's lunch? Yes. So it was, but it was a happy, it was a happy childhood, and from there you went um, to Cambridge. Um, well, you went to school. You went, you went to school in Yorkshire, as you said, and then after that you went to Cambridge to read English, and then you went to acting school. How did that go down with your parents? Well, of course, it wasn't exactly what they planned. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, now people have this extraordinary variety of careers 
and you say to someone, oh, you know, what's Isabella doing now? And they, and they say, oh, she's in presentational science or something. And you think, what the hell's that? But it wasn't like that then. You kind of went into the city or the forces, or if you were really stupid, you were a state agent, you know, and that was about it. Um, and, and uh, of course, you didn't plan on showbiz. So because I knew this, I, um, I, I, I thought, well, I'll get into a drama school without telling them, because if I don't get in, then I don't have to have the row. You know, so I got in, one of my brothers sort of helped me, but I, and I got into a school now defunct called Weber Douglas, which was in South Ken. And in fact, uh, Weber Douglas had been used sort of in the 40s and 50s for people to send their daughters to, and they didn't want them to be actresses, but they wanted to learn how to sort of speak in public, you know, so they could go off and marry some ambassador. And so in a way, it was a bit like a sort of finishing school. But, but anyway, I got in. Were and you the I, only man? And, oh, no, no, there, oh, were, there were men. No. But uh, probably the standard was a bit lower for the men. But, um, uh, thank God. But anyway, I got in. And then I thought, well, now I've got to tell them. And I remember my mother came up to collect me from Cambridge at the end of the course. And we sort of loaded everything in the car. We were driving back. And she said, you know, well, now that's done. And you, have you given any thought, really, to what you're doing now? You know, and blah, blah, blah. And um, I said, you know, I thought, here goes. And I said, I'm going to be an actor. I've got myself a place at Weber Douglas. The course is for eight terms. You have to pay. Uh, and, and, and that's it. So there was this long silence. She was driving along. And then finally, after a long time, she said, don't tell your father. <laughs> so I, I, I said, well, I've got to tell him at some point because he's got to write the checks. She said, I will tell your father. So what happens? I was going on a holiday, which I kind of used in Past Imperfect. So, so a friend of ours was in Portugal, and he'd taken a villa in Estoril, and he said to all of us, a great group of us, if you can get here, you can have a free holiday, but you've got to get yourself here. So a whole pack of us went off, and we stayed in Paris, and we sort of camped our way across Spain. I mean, being intense, not the other way. And... Um, <laughs> And, and we finally got to Portugal. And then we were flying, a friend of mine and I were flying to join my parents in Southern Ireland, where we had a sort of uh, holiday house. And uh, anyway, as it was going to, the whole thing was going to take eight weeks. And as we drove out of the gates, my mother turned to my father and said, Julian's going to be an actor, he's going to drama school, we're paying, it lasts for eight terms, blah, blah, blah. And of course, Nobody can be angry for eight weeks, you know, that was her thinking. So by the time I saw him again, you know, he just says, oh, you, you know, but he'd done all the shouting. So, he, I mean, they were very good, really, because it, he wanted me to go into the foreign office. Now, it was, I wasn't at all the type the foreign office were looking for then. And, um, and so it was a bit of a broken dream for him. But uh, he, was, he was very good, but he said to me, you know, we will put you through drama school, and that's fine, and, and if you're sure it's what you want. So, but the day you leave drama school, that is the last penny you receive in the way of an allowance. Of course, I thought this was incredibly sort of draconian and severe, but, but what it was was that he thought, if, it, if, he, if I wasn't going to be able to make it work, let's find out quickly. He said, you can live at home for nothing, but no extra money than that. And, uh, of course, it was an incredible incentive. I did cheat a bit. I used to, my mother used to say, are you coming down this weekend? And I'd say, yes, I think so. I think it'll be all right as long as I use the handbrake, you know. And she'd go, what do you mean, darling? And, and I'd say, oh, well, uh, you know, the brakes aren't very good, but I haven't got enough money. Oh, darling, get it mended, you know. Please don't tell your father. But... Um, <laughs> But she never cheated that much. She never gave yeah. me a secret allowance. But, of course, it was very, very much of a motive. You know, I, I did think, because all your friends think you're mad to become an actor, and I think that's probably true now. I don't think that's changed. And you do have this kind of, I'll show you, you know, like someone in a musical comedy. And, and I think that did prompt me into working very, very hard to get work. And did you do, I mean, this, the moniker for Glenn, other than that, were you, I mean, how, were you good? Well, you said I could ask you anything. In, in the moniker for Glenn, I was 
absolutely marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yes, I mean, I think... Uh, I, I think I, like, you know, most people who make a living, and I never had another job. I mean, for 20 years I lived off acting. I, there were things I could do. Yeah. There were things I could do. I could play characters who were sort of absurd or stupid or limited or prejudiced, but you were sort of fond of them. Uh, and that was really my stock in trade. Mm. I did also do quite a nice line in horrible cabinet ministers with camel hair coats, but, um, but that was sort of subsidiary and for television mainly. On stage, mm. I was mainly the lovable silly ass. I mean, I, it is a thing that actors hate being typecast, but actually I always think Betty Davis was right when she said the actor who isn't typecast doesn't work. There's got to be one kind of part, or maybe two, that when they're looking for that and they write five names down on a piece of paper, you've got to be one of those five, or you're never going to get any kind of career. And, you know, I was quite lucky. I mean, I went straight into Red, then I went into the West End. I was in the West End for four or five years. Then I went to Hollywood, and I had a couple of... I mean, the Hollywood excursion, I mean, I'd gone out to be the new Peter Ustinov, you know, the new Robert Morley, uh, a great film star. I mean... The high point I actually reached was when I came second to replace the dwarf on Fantasy Island. <laughs> so I can't pretend it was a succès fou, but uh, it was nevertheless a very useful period because when I was in Hollywood, I rediscovered my love of film. When, when you're in drama school in England, and astonishingly this still obtains really, there is this great emphasis on theatre. Theatre, theatre, theatre. Theatre's the real thing. Got to get back on the boards. Oh, I've been so long away from the theatre. All of that goes on. And, you know, rather like Goebbels told us, if you keep telling someone something, they get to believe it. Mm. And you get sucked into it. And I remember, you know, I must get back to the theatre. And I wasn't really interested in the theatre. And I'd gone into, the, into acting, I'd gone into show business to be in the movies, to be on television. I was interested in the camera. Mm. And when I got to Hollywood and I started getting jobs in American television, which I did, you know, I mean, they weren't particularly wonderful, but I was just a running character in some, I don't know, some cops and robbers nonsense. And, and I thought, no, this is, this is what I care about. This is what interests me. Because when I was on stage... And I would go into rehearsal. I used to go from sort of terror to boredom without an intervening period, you know. There should be a moment where you're enjoying it. And, and I didn't have that. Whereas when I was on a set, when I was on a film set, I wanted to know I, why was the lighting guy changing that light? What, what was the sound? What was different when he put that furry thing over the mic? Why, how, why was he backing up the, the, the hidden mic? And so all of it fascinated me. And... I realized that the whole process of making films was what I loved. That was what I really cared about. And I never re then I came back to England because my yes. career took me back. I got more work in England. But I never lost that. Yeah. Now, now, while you were doing all that, sort of simultaneously at some stage in the sort of late 60s, and I don't want to go through all of it, but you did have a period. In the late 60s? I was only when about were, 20. Well, oh, well, well, well I okay, 30. so I have... A, how old were you then? In, the in, in 68, I was... 68, yes. In 68, I was 19. Oh, OK. Well, perhaps a little bit later. I'm talking about the period in London in the 60s. Yes. Late 60s, when you were this strange thing called a Deb's Delight. <laughs> and you sort of... And it seems to me that that somehow or other was, or was sort of linked to your acting career because you sort of kind of faked your way slightly into this, didn't you? By sort of... I mean, a lot of your two novels, Snobs and Past Imperfect, draw on your experiences in this time of London in the 60s on the cusp of a time when the old world was on moving out. out and the new uh, sort of trendy, groovy world was, was coming in. And you were straddling that yourself. Well, and it's I very good uh, copy, I think. It's... I was in a way, I mean, it was a strange time for me. I had had that experience, no doubt shared with some people in this tent, of being completely overshadowed by a sibling. And I had grown up in the shadow of my brother, 
who was very handsome and very trendy and very much of that time. He was always on a, going to India and Nepal and studying with Maharishis, and, and he looked like a Terence Stamp, you know. And, and I always remember hearing at a party two girls talking, and one of them saying, how are you getting on with your party next? She said, oh, we're all right, we haven't got enough boys. And the other one said, why don't you ask the fellows, brothers? And, and the first one said, well, I would, but to get the good-looking one, you have to have the boring, fat one. <laughs> and, and, and I remember this being, you know, a tiny bit depressing, actually. Um, and, and what happened was, because he was very groovy and all the rest of it, in, in those days, as you know, Peter Towner, this funny old guy with a sort of cowlick of hair who used to run the season, he used to go through Burke's gentry and Burke's peerage and he would look out boys and girls who were the right age and write to the girls' mothers. But the boys, he would write to themselves and invite them for a drink at his funny flat in Chelsea Manor Street. And my brother Rory was an absolute target for him. But Rory wouldn't do any of that stuff. He was, he was very much against it. He thought it was all horrible. And really, he was kind of a hippie, you know. And, and then when I got my invitation, I saw a chance to get out from under that shadow, to have a new group, a new social group that had nothing to do with him. And I would be this person. And it was an overlap with Cambridge because a lot of guys at Cambridge were whizzing. We used to drive up and down, you know, the M1 after these parties. And, of course, it's terrible now to think of because we were so drunk. I remember we, we used to hide one eye like this sort of, you know, so it, to stop the lines separating and, uh, and all that, which, of course, is terrible. And I, I don't defend it for a moment. Uh, I remember doing a U-turn because we'd missed the exit for Cambridge. God. But anyway, um, uh, it was a different world. And I think that was the appeal. But I think also I was very, um, a very modest member of that group. I, you know, I was in Burks. I was in one of those families. But it was a very junior family, very minor. And I was a minor branch in a minor family. So... I had no importance at all, and I would go to these things, you know, again, because they were short of boys, you know, or you'd meet the daughter and she'd make a laugh or something and, and you'd, she'd stick you on the list. And I think that that is a very good position to see a world, mm. because nobody's, nobody puts on the act for you. You know, when you're the guest of honour, and you're the thing, then everything you say is funny or wise or both. But when you're just sitting there on the corner, you know, my, my mother always used to call the least uh, sort of status chair at the table starvation corner, because by the time that the plates of everything got to you, there was just a sort of bit of old gristle lying there. And, um, and, and that was, I was always at starvation corner. I mean, you were sort of, I, I, you were sort of like Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby. You know, you yes, were in it, yes. you were there, but you were, you were actually an observer, as you say, no one was, and I think it stood you in good stead. Or for Charles observing, Ryder. Or Charles Ryder, for observing a sort of social situation which, you know, re-emerges, obviously, in, in Gosford Park and then uh, the, again in Downton Abbey. And I think your first-hand experience of that sort of, of society on the cusp, very snobbish, very m mired in its ways in some way, clashing with the kind of new generation that was coming along and um, perhaps yes, not buying say. into it in, in the same way as their parents had. I, I agree with that, except mm. I don't think... I don't really believe in... in tears of people being snobbish any more than they're beautiful or clever. I think you can find snobs at any level of society, and I think you can find other people who are not snobbish. What, what is a snob? I think a snob is someone who hides behind uh, an artificial social situation in order to persuade themselves they are a better human being. And, uh, you is know, it attached you can... to money at all? Well, you can be a money snob. I don't think you have to be a money snob, actually. But it's you can class. be snobbish about anything. We're talking about class. Well, though. yes, but you get snobbery in my business. You get a tremendous lack of generosity often towards people who are, say, uh, in soap operas or in some kind of work they think is beneath them. And you will find in casting, you find people saying, oh, but they were in coronation. And we had that with... 
Downton. Well, the two actors we took from Coronation Street are Anna, who play, who uh, it plays, you know, Bates's love, the, the maid Anna, and Thomas, the the kind of sympathetic evil footman. And I think they're two of the best characters in the show. And you know, we, we had a few people who said, "It's uh, who cares that they did Coronation? Probably that was the best job they were offered at that time, and that's why they took them." Mm -hmm. And they were very, very good, and now we're going to offer them this job. Mm -hmm. But you do get people say, oh, well, you know, you sure are so popular. I mean, that, for me, is just as snobbish as someone who, who doesn't want to have you for dinner because your father was in trade. You know, it's, it's all bollocks, really. Right. <laughs> uh, we must move on a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I really want to get to these, because I want to leave time for people to, to ask questions, because I know they'll have them. But I, I just want to um, talk about the two things that were, this is fast forwarding, that were the sort of the breaks in your life, not, not simultaneously. But one, one I'd like to ask you about um, Gosford Park briefly. Um, but the other one, which I do because I'm a romantic, I want to know about Emma. How, how did it happen? Did you? <laughs> Emma is my wife. <laughs> over there, the woman in the <laughs> turban. Um, I, it, I, ha I mean, normally, I am as psychic as a door. I can get eight hours in the room where someone was strangled the week before. And I just am totally, you know those people who are going to say, there's been a great unhappiness in this house. I, I just don't have that. And... Um, I, it, but I did have one psychic moment, and that was I went to this party, as a cocktail party in Harley Street, of this funny old girl who was some um, girlfriend of a cousin of my father's. I'm rather fond of her, actually. And I went because I was trying to see a friend who was leaving for America, and she was getting married. Or something. And I knew if I didn't go, I wouldn't see her before she went. But the odd thing was I didn't really want to go. But my mother always used to say... Uh, go to everything you're invited to. You are just as likely to meet the love of your life at a bad party as at a good one. Quite good advice, actually. Um, I'll give you the other bit of that. Was If you want to be happily married, marry a happy person. Again, quite good advice. Not taken by half one's address book. But anyway, um, I went to this party and there were, it wasn't a theatrical one at all it was just the usual old hodgepodge and, uh, and I saw a guy who was an actor but I w w was talking called John Mulder Brown and I went over to say hello to him who I knew and he said to me do you know Emma Kitchener and she turned to me and said you know how do you do and I knew I was going to marry her and I had this extraordinary here she is she's finally turned up and, was it, and was it, is it unfair? Sorry to interrupt. Just, was it quite late in the day? Well, quite late. I mean, yeah. it was. I was 39. I don't know how, as long as there's a three in there somewhere. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I thought I'm going to marry this girl. And I was talking to her. And after about 20 minutes, I proposed to her. I said, I, I wonder if you'd like to marry me. Um, <laughs> because I have a feeling we're going to get married. And, uh, of course, she, she thought I was completely mad, I remember. And, and I said to her, well, will you have lunch? With me? Oh, I never have lunch. And, and I, I said, I said, well, will you have dinner? with? Oh, I'm very busy. And, and, and I said, well, just give me your telephone. I said, I never give my number to strange men. And that was the end of that. So uh, I tracked her down. I wrote to her mother. I found her mother's address, and I wrote to her mother, uh, her, via her mother. Of course, my mother-in-law probably tossed it into the flames if she had, but no, but anyway. Uh, and we met for dinner, and we were in this restaurant. There were pictures of Venice around the walls. There was a restaurant in Sloan Street, Lower Sloan Street. And I said, when we get married, shall we go to Venice for our honeymoon? And she said, if you keep this up, I'm leaving. And 15 months later, we married and we went to Venice for our honeymoon. How's that for singularity of purpose? And then the, straight, the rather spooky thing was our son was born. We'd met on the 13th of January, 1989. And our son was born on the 13th of January, 1991. So our meeting is commemorated with all his birthdays. You see, it's spooky. It's very romantic, and 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 uh, it gives hope to people who. You 
God. I mean, if not... even I can find someone. No, no. There must be someone out there. Wow. The other great thing that The other area where we can give some hope is the fact that your career finally got going. I've tried to turn this into a sort of happy thing. Yeah. Um, Gosford Park um, was an absolutely... Well, I thought... I don't know how many people have seen that film. I... It was wonderful. I remember going to see it um, with my friend Rachel. In um, We went in the King's Road cinema. And um, we'd spotted a man we knew who was the father of, of our friend, not with his wife. Yes, so we couldn't decide Gripping. whether to watch him or the screen. <laughs> my father had a rule about that, you know, which I must tell you. He said... If you're driving up through England and you break down in some unknown little town and the man says, go and have lunch and I'll have it mended after, and you go into a Chinese restaurant and you see someone you know with a woman who is not his wife, you must say nothing because it is so, so bad luck for him that you turned up. But if you go into the Mirabelle and you see a man dining with a woman who's not his wife, you can tell the world because if they do it in public, they want to be found out. And they want to precipitate the crisis. So I think going into uh, King's Road Cinema, you were entitled to tell everyone. Well, we didn't. So he had to wait even longer <laughs> to have it out with his wife. But the thing was, the movie finally grabbed our attention. And it is, it's the most fantastic movie. And um, you won an Oscar with it. Uh, what greater accolade can, can there possibly be? You went straight to the top of the tree. Um, in in your in well not in your acting profession but in your in your writing profession, um, and Downton grew out of that success. That's right, isn't it? Yes, I mean, you know, it was ten years later. I mean, the Gosford phenomenon was very strange because. I had d written some children's strips at the mm. BBC and they got made and then the head of department left and I started to write adult script. Well, that sounds more interesting than they were. Scripts for grown-ups. Um, and, and I'd written one on spec for this guy, Bob Balaban, an American. And he was trying to set up a film with Robert Altman about an English country house. And for some reason which I've never got to the bottom they couldn't get a writer they, they tried everyone no one wanted to do it I've always felt it was the intervention of my dead mama but anyway for some reason they couldn't and so I had this telephone call out of the blue one day in the kitchen saying would you like to write a film for Robert Altman I thought well yeah but um I never believed it would happen because it seemed so impossible. I'd never had a film made. I'd only had some kids' television made. But then I thought, well, if I don't take it seriously and the film is made with someone else, you know, then I'll have to commit suicide. So uh, to avoid that, I did take it seriously and I wrote it. But I didn't believe it would happen. And then I sent the first draft off to, to Altman and he wrote back, or, or telephone and said, we want to bring you out to California for three days to work on the script. And that was the first moment that I thought it might happen. And he told me afterwards that it, he never thought it would happen either. He was only humouring Balaban. And it was only when he read the draft that he suddenly thought, wait a minute, perhaps there is a film in this. So it was a rather strange... But, you know, I was very, very lucky with Altman. I mean, my relationship with Altman is, is, is complicated because in some ways you know, he was very difficult. He was a huge, great bear of a man. And I remember the, the um, script um, continuity woman and me, we used to call him the exploding bear. And, uh, you know, we would sort of fight and everything else. But he was incredibly loyal to me. And the studio, obviously, I mean, the picture was not a big movie, but it cost, you know, 23 million or something. And, and that was 10 years ago. I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot of money to me, where it is in terms of films. And, of course, the studio wanted other people. You know, they, were, they didn't understand the script. I mean, there was one moment when we were putting in that thing that servants took their employers' names in a house party to make it less complicated for the, for the resident staff and so on. Um, and they rang him up and they said, this script's already got more characters than the Second World War and now they've all got the same name. <laughs> 
and, and they didn't understand. They said, you know, just for a polish, Bob. And he wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't allow it. He, he said, no, I've gone with this guy. I agree with his vision of this thing. I'm not having anyone else. Now, I can't tell you how rare that is in Hollywood. I mean, mm. n normally the, they buy you a drink. There'd be tears in their eyes that they would have to give in. And he wouldn't. And so, you know, often people say, I owe a great deal to someone. I don't owe a great deal to him. I owe everything to him because he fought that battle. Mm. And I did end up winning the Oscar. Everything came from that. I mean, Hollywood is... Well, actually, I don't know if he's here. Um, Virginia's husband, Bill Nicholson, is he here? There he is. I mean, uh, Bill Nicholson, very successful uh, Hollywood writer with Shadowlands and Gladiator and now uh, Les Mis and everything, to his credit. And it always makes me laugh. Whenever we meet, uh, we do nothing but complain <laughs> about... Hollywood, and both our wives say, God, you two, you're so awful because all you do is complain. There are so many people who would love to have your career. And we say, yes, but we can't complain to them. <laughs> so we meet and go on about how awful these people are. But it is a very, very tough world. And they, these people are very tough. And for me to find my first lucky break from someone who was prepared to go to the wall for people who were humming and hawing about whether or not they were going to put up the money... And one way to increase the chances of them doing so was to take a writer of their choice, and he refused. I mean, that is really extraordinary. And that, that was the moment for me. So it was a big, uh, you know, a life changer completely. Mm. Fantastic. And from it, um, from it grew, grew Downton. And uh, we don't have enough time if we're going to leave some time for questions for me to... I don't think we should risk further. another clip, do but, you? No, no, I, definitely not. But um, I just want to ask, um, well, first of all, um, and do you, I'm not going to allow you, although I long for you to, but to do it, but I'm not going to let you go on about your great aunt Izzy, who is the great inspiration for, um, the Izzy. Ma for Izzy, sorry, for Maggie Smith's character. But it does amaze me that at such a young age, and it's a lesson to me and to everybody, I think, really, is that when you know a old person who is full of amazing memories pay attention oh. pay attention listen to them ask them everything about their lives because it's just endlessly riveting well, and I, you did that with Aunt Izzy but you can't it. talk about her because no I did do it but I didn't take a tape recorder mm. and anyone out there who is thinking I, I must speak to Aunt Louisa before she you know either snuffs it or loses her marbles take a tape recorder I mean, I was very lucky, actually, because I got interested in the past, in my family's past, in the, in the world's past, mm. when I was very young, mm. and they were all still alive. Mm. And that was incredibly mm. lucky. My brothers were totally uninterested until years later, and by that time, everyone was dead. And, you know, it was a big plus for me that, that kept bringing rewards. I'm just going to ask you one question. Is there ever going to be any romance between um, Carson and Mrs. Hughes? Because they love each other. They do. I'm not going to tell you. Okay. Um, series four is, um, you're writing it now, although you're having a day off in Charleston, but you're going, you, you're in the middle of writing well, I'm it. Nearly, it's being filmed at the moment. It's being filmed. I'm nearly yeah. at the end. And it's set in the 20s. 20s. And it does, how far does it go up to? Well, we don't... I mean, we normally do about two, two and a half years per mm. series. Mm. But uh, we certainly... I, I like the 20s. I think the 20s is not overdone. I think the 30s, we've all seen a million dramas set in the 30s. But the 20s was this odd period when initially... It was almost as if not that much had changed. But as the decade went on, it became clearer and clearer that huge changes had occurred. And you had, um, the, you know, the landed aristocracy, in a sense, uh, a group of people under fire and, and some of them surviving, getting through, you know, and there they still are today. But um, for a lot of the families that went under, it was in that 
20-year period between 1920 and, uh, well, 19 and 1939 that brought them down and, and all these different influences and also like after any war, enormous numbers of things have been developed for the war that then come to have a role to play in peace. So you get these tremendous changes, I mean good changes in, in medicine and surgery and um, transport and all of these things often come out of war, there would, there would be massive changes after the Second World War. So it seems an interesting period where we have some characters like Violet essentially still lodged in the thinking of the 19th century, whereas others have made life choices they would not have made 20 or 30 years earlier. And, and you know, I think that's, that gives us a certain kind of fun allowance. Um, I won't ask about Mary because... Um because you didn't get any answer for the last one. I didn't get any answer for the last one. I will ask, are you going to audition for a part in Danton? No, I once, ages ago, I did a lot of work on a script where they'd already spent all the money. And the only way I could get paid was to write a part for myself in this thing. <laughs> and I remember the producer at the BBC kept saying, I don't quite understand why this solicitor keeps turning up in every episode. <laughs> And I said, oh, absolute axis on which the story turns. But um, it was the only way I could get any money. And, and, but when we actually made the show, I found it very uncomfortable to spend part of the time behind the camera being a grown-up and talking about framing and development of character narrative and things. And then the other part, suddenly, you know, oh, have I got enough mascara? And I, I just, it was a very difficult double, and I've never really wanted to do it again. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I mean, people do, you know, Clint Eastwood and everything else, yeah. direct films in which they play great leading roles, and I admire it very much, actually, but I don't think it's within my power. I'm going to see if uh, anybody else is uh, brave enough to push Julian a tiny bit on Mary's <laughs> widowhood uh, or anything else that anybody would like to ask. I think there are a couple of mics going around. So if people like to put up their hand, if they've got anything to ask one Julian. And there's one just there. Yeah, Holly. How did you that, if you take the, could you possibly, would you mind standing up yes. so that we can, we can see can you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Marvellously. Uh, how did you select Lady Mary's first lover? Well, the story of that, it's rather interesting. that I, I, I'm, uh, One of the things that annoyed me about uh, the first series, which doesn't anymore, was there was always an assumption that when someone complained and said, oh, this song was published later or this word came into it, you know, the newspapers would always assume that the complainant was correct and the show was wrong. In fact, I don't mean if there was a television aerial, because either there was or there wasn't, but with those things, usually the show was right and the complainant was wrong. But of all the, the complaints, the one story that was completely unbelievable was the death of Mr. Pamuk. Now, in fact, almost the only plot in Downton that is of documentary reality is the death of Mr. Pamuk. And that was because Emma and I were staying in a house uh, of, 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 of a relation of hers. And the, uh, this is years ago, years before Downton, and the owner had just made this incredible discovery. He was reading the diary of a great aunt, and there had been a house party in about 1895, and during this house party, there was a one-bedroom passage was only for women. Lots of houses had bachelor corridors, but this was only for single women and, you know, spinsters and, and widows and young girls and so on. And one of these women had smuggled a diplomat into her bedroom, and um, he had died during the entertainment. <laughs> and, and she, of course, poor woman, completely flummoxed, didn't know what to do. And finally, she, she knocked on the next door bedroom. And this blameless matron opened the door, was absolutely horrified by the revelation, but quick enough to realize that if it got out, they would figure in the greatest scandal of that year in London. It would be all round every drawing room by Friday. And so, with tremendous resolution, they woke up all the women along this corridor, and all these, you know, sort of widows and, and debs and things came out. And together, they carried this corpse, the length of one of England's great houses, and got it back into its own bed, the other end. So anyway, uh, I, and then he read his great-grandfather's 
diary of the same period, and it said, rather a sad weekend, nice Mr. Fing was found dead by his valet in his bed on Sunday morning. So they got away with it. And of course, the great difference between our grandparents' generation and our own is that they could keep their own secrets. We can't keep a secret to save our lives. Few everyone's got to blather away about whatever went wrong with their marriage or their childhood, but they weren't like that. And as I listened to this story, I thought, there's something in this for me. And I suppose the only touch that I did change was I made him Turkish because I just wanted him to be a little bit outside the system. And I also wanted the one sort of slight joke, which is when uh, they're talking about, you know, and he says, I'm not offering marriage. You know, I don't suppose your parents would approve. And, and Mary is rather sort of smug, says, ooh, I don't think they would. And, and Pamuk says, no, neither would, neither would mine. And, and, and you can see Mary and Michelle did it so well. And Mary goes, you know, and so I thought that would be fun. But, but anyway, that is how the Pamuk story was born. So every time the newspaper said this could never have happened, I wanted to write in and say, not only could it, it did. Anyone else like to ask a question? This is a couple over here. Commercial breaks on British television, how much influence, if any, does the writer have on when these occur? Um, how much does it affect the writing? And do you feel they've become too intrusive, too, too frequent and too long? Well, of course, it's a tricky one, this, because we make the show with the money raised by the advertising. So when, I mean, we had this debate in Parliament not very long ago about advertising on television. People were saying we must get rid of them. Well, I mean, if we got rid of them, we'd get rid of the show with it. And so they are a, a, a part of life. The only influence the writer, I mean, not alone, but the writer and the producers have, is the placing within a degree. I mean, it's got to be about every however many minutes it is, but you can move it back and forth to put it in a more appropriate break between scenes, and you also will perhaps reorder the scenes so you have a better finish before the commercial break so that they're more likely to stay with the show. You know, there's a certain amount of juggling of that. As for whether there are too many, in the second year of Downton, we were allowed to extend the show to about an hour and ten minutes, but that created another commercial break. And the public became so vociferous in their opposition to advertising that we actually made the decision to shrink the show back to an hour so we didn't have to have that fifth break. It was just one too many, uh, which I think was probably right. Although, of course, I was a bit sad because you had to sort of telescope it a bit more. But, you know, finally, the difficulty is that the revenue from advertising is not what it was because there are now so many channels, uh, the, there are so many different options in the way you watch. I mean, our son what tends to see the moment that a program is transmitted is really like a film being released. He doesn't feel he has to watch it then. He just feels from then he can watch it on, on iPlay or on Sky, on, you know, blah, blah. And so they're much less fettered. I mean, in the old days, when there were three channels, only one of them was commercial, you could charge an enormous amount for the advertising because at least a third of the population be watching it. And that doesn't happen now. So really, realistically, unless we get into the American option of subscription television, which we don't have here yet in any kind of meaningful way. I mean, you pay to be on Sky and things, but it ha we haven't really got to anything like uh, HBO or whatever, where you pay a perfectly, you know, f fairly uh, reasonable thing. It's coming because we have Netflix and things where you pay a, a monthly fee. And maybe that's the option. I mean, I'm not ruling it out because that frees you from advertising. And it's like uh, NBC, uh, you know, Masterpiece in America, where PBS, where you, 
you do pay a subscription. Oh, you pay. They're there voluntary. But I mean, they live on subscriptions. Maybe that's the future. But until we get there, uh, advertising, I'm afraid, is the price we pay for uh, for ITV drama, which at the moment I think is of a very high standard. I think ITV drama has got the trick of the present period of television viewing rather better than BBC. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I, to quote Mary Mandy Rice Davis? But nevertheless, I do. Julian, I, I, it's awful, but we've come to the end of our time. We could go on forever, all the stories and so on. I just want to say that this book, which we've got planned to read tons we're of things. We're going to read from, you an we're extract. Going to read, but we've run out of time. It's just amazing. It's the scripts of the, fir of the first season, but it's not only the scripts. It's got all Julian's sort of secret, how it happened, what went wrong, um, where he got criticism for it, justifying it in every case. Not in every in, in instance. Almost every, um, and uh, it's completely, it's in. the most fantastic book, actually, because it sort of takes you back through all of season one, all over the great Turkish scandal and so on. Well, can't I just read that one? Can, can he just read can that one? Can I just one? read that just, one? Okay, you have permission to it's read that one. That it's just very this, funny. It, this, is, this is when... Um, and Mary turns up on the horse at the beginning of the episode when Matthew uh, comes to doubt in the second episode two, and he comes there, and uh, she turns up on the horse, and then she comes into the house and overhears him saying he's going to be flung at the head of one of the daughters, and she then flounces off, and he runs out afterwards. This scene is annoying because somehow the riding habit got put on wrongly. When a woman was riding side saddles, she wore breeches and boots under the skirt of her habit to protect her legs, but these were concealed by the habit. In period drama on television, you'll often see petticoats fluttering away and stockinged legs as the skirt flies up, which is all complete nonsense. Bare or stockinged legs would be rubbed raw of skin within five minutes. Women wore perfectly normal breeches and boots, and so the skirt of the riding habit was essentially a coat which was designed to break open at the waist if she fell so she would not be dragged. But of course, the wrap-over part of it was meant to go underneath against the horse, and for some reason here, it was put on backwards. You can look out for this. When Matthew comes out and Mary is in the saddle, you can actually see her breached leg. We were told off for this by several viewers, and quite right too. So it is that but the moment of when you watch things, and it's always very irritating when you, you see a mistake and you can't rectify it. There's a, there's a moment when the Duke in the first series shakes hands with his glove on. And, and I said, don't we, don't we have any other shot that we can cut the hand out? There was no other shot. And all of that goes on with every episode, really. Well, the thing is, we'll all watch them all again and look forward to uh, series four starting in September. Is that right? September, you've got a date. Yeah, can't wait. Thank you so much, Julian. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I don't want to curtail the applause for a second, but... Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will absolutely agree with me that there really couldn't have been a better opening to the 24th Charleston Literary Festival. What a fantastic session. I feel I know you even better. Fabulous, fabulous. So witty, funny, warm, irreverent, a great raconteur. I think I mentioned something at the beginning about being a national treasure, and I, f I feel that that's, you know... Even more the case. So, Julian, thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of everyone at Charleston for such a wonderful session. No, Julian, thank you, thank you. I mean, I think this is a wonderful place, and I think you're incredibly lucky to have it in the area. I, it's a marvellous, marvellous house, and I feel very blessed to have been asked here. Well, we feel thoroughly honoured to have you, and... Thank you. And... Not sure if Juliet will ever forgive me for the biography, but Juliet, thank you so much for your wonderfully perceptive questions. You know, I, I, I don't know where to start really, but um, I shall remember for a while camping across Spain, <laughs> <laughs> the smells of life, and, and you know many of your other wonderful anecdotes, Julian. So, Julian, Juliet, thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can I just um, very politely ask if you might stay seated for a moment? 
Um, Julian has very kindly agreed to sign copies of his book. Juliet took the words right out of my mouth. It just seems like a fabulous book. The footnotes, as soon as you start reading, are just full of life, and, and I recommend it highly to you. So Julian will be signing outside. And again, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming. Thank you.